I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life, to live so sturdily and Spartan-like as to reduce it to its lowest terms, and, if it proved to be mean, to get the whole and genuine meanness of it, or if it were sublime, to know it by experience and to give a true account of it. When I wrote the following pages, or rather the bulk of them, I lived alone in the woods, a mile from any neighbor, in a house which I had built myself on the shore of Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts, and earned my living by the labor of my... When I first took up my abode in the woods, my house was not finished. It was a pleasant hillside where I worked, covered with pine woods, through which I looked out on the pond and a small open field in the woods where pines and hickories were springing up. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Henry! Henry! Are you all right? Henry! July 1845. My dear Henry, Mr. Emerson has assisted my family in acquiring a house near Conquer, and there we are now, riding, living like philosophers, which is to say with little but happily. I will visit you soon and bring Mr. Garrison of the Liberator. We have all been so inspired by his earnest and unequivocal writings regarding the moral stain of slavery on our nation. Perhaps he will speak at our Lyceum on the topic. Yours truly, A. Bronson Alcott. There is some of the same fitness in a man's building his own house that there is in a bird's building its own nest. Who knows, but if men constructed their dwellings with their own hands and provided food for themselves and families simply and honestly enough. What are you doing now? Emerson asked. Do you keep a journal? So I make my first entry today. July, 1845. Dear Mr. Thoreau, 
My employer, Dr. Agassi, was happy to meet you last month with Mr. Emerson and was quite impressed with your knowledge of local biology. He wonders if you might be able to provide some specimens for him to use in his work. Dr. Agassi would gladly come to Concord to collect such specimens himself, but is drawn away by numerous and pressing engagements. If you are amenable to this idea, we will soon send you requests for these items and are happy to pay you for your trouble. Sincerely, James Elliot Cabot, assistant to Dr. Agassi, Harvard University. July 4th, 1845. Dearest Henry, congratulations on the start of your experiment. I hope that the work goes well and the ideas are fruitful. Mr. Emerson says you are intent to devour yourself in our woods, but I hope that you will remember to take good care and keep yourself well. Mother worries, as do I. Your loving sister, Sophia. My residence was more favorable, not only to thought, but to serious reading, than a university. And though I was beyond the range of the ordinary circulating library, I had more than ever come within the influence of those books which circulate round the world. The grand necessity, then, for our bodies is to keep warm, to keep the vital heat in us.
July 1845. Dear Henry, you've told me yourself that it is difficult to begin anything without borrowing, and I know that you can use an axe, so I've left one for you in my front yard by the chopping stump. Do come by any time to fetch it. Perhaps we can discuss the new lecture I am working on while you are here. Your friend, Ralph Waldo Emerson. I learned that it would cost incredibly little trouble to obtain one's necessary food, even in this latitude, that a man may use as simple a diet as the animals, and yet retain health and strength. Every day or two I stroll to the village to hear some of the gossip which is incessantly going on there, circulating either from mouth to mouth or from newspaper to newspaper, and which, taken in homeopathic doses, was really as refreshing in its way as the rustle of leaves and the peeping of frogs. It's very good to make your acquaintance, Mr. Thoreau. Your sister seems to believe our thoughts and philosophies are very much aligned. It is good to find a youth so interested in the finer fruits of thought. 
Oh, Henry. How goes your new experiment? Has genius struck yet at my woodlot? Yes, in fact, the experiment is going quite well. Excellent to hear. I do look forward to reading your new work. I hope you're keeping a good journal, full of your insights about life in the woods. Since you're here, I could use your assistance with some research I'm doing for a new lecture. Could you spare the time to help me? Certainly. Well, thank you. I know you're quite busy with your own work, but I need help finding my copy of Homer's Iliad. I saw that you were reading it down by a new cabin. Do you still have it there? Yes, I have seen it and can get it for you. Oh, that's wonderful. When you come back, we can discuss the passage I'm looking for. In the meanwhile, I found some books on bean planting and local wildlife you might find useful. I put them on the table in my library for you. I look forward to it. Goodbye for now. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Recommendation for Henry David Thoreau. I cordially recommend Mr. Henry D. Thoreau, a graduate of Harvard University in August 1837, to the confidence of such parents or guardians as may propose to employ him as an instructor. I have the highest confidence in Mr. Thoreau's moral character and in his intellectual ability. He is an excellent scholar, a man of energy and kindness, and I shall esteem the town fortunate that secures his services. R. Waldo Emerson.
Our whole life is startlingly moral. There is never an instant's truce between virtue and vice. Goodness is the only investment that never fails. My house was on the side of a hill, immediately on the edge of the larger wood, in the midst of a young forest of pitch pines and hickories, and half a dozen rods from the pond, to which a narrow footpath led down the hill. In my front yard grew the strawberry, blackberry, and life everlasting, John's wart and goldenrod, shrub oaks and sand cherry, blueberry and groundnut. The necessaries of life for man in this climate may, accurately enough, be distributed under the several heads of food, shelter, clothing, and fuel. For not till we have secured these are we prepared to entertain the true problems of life with freedom and a prospect of success. As I sit at my window this summer afternoon, Hawks are circling about my clearing, the tantivy of wild pigeons, flying by two and threes athwart my view, or perching restless on the white pine boughs behind my house, give a voice to the air. A fish hawk dimples the glassy surface of the pond and brings up a fish. A mink steals out of the marsh before my door and seizes a frog by the shore. The sedge is bending under the weight of the reed birds flitting hither and thither, and for the last half hour I have heard the rattle of railroad cars, now dying away.
When I was four years old, as I well remember, I was brought from Boston to this my native town, through these very woods in this field, to the pond. It is one of the oldest scenes stamped on my memory, and now tonight my flute has waked the echoes over that very water. I am no more lonely than the loon in the pond that laughs so loud, or than Walden Pond itself. I am no more lonely than a single mullion or dandelion in a pasture, or a bean leaf, or a sorrel, or a horsefly, or a bumblebee. I am no more lonely than the millbrook, or a weathercock, or the north star, or the south wind, or an April shower, or a January thaw, or the first spider in a new house.
I kept Homer's Iliad on my table through the summer, though I looked at his page only now and then. Regularly at half past seven, in one part of the summer, after the evening train had gone by, the whippoorwills chanted their vespers for half an hour, sitting on a stump by my door, or upon the ridge pole of the house.
Dear Miss Fuller, it was a pleasure to meet you and thank you for the introductions to such brilliant new company. I am sure that writers such as these will fill our new journal with rays of golden talent. I have another name to add to the roster of our dial, Mr. Henry David Thoreau, a fine, brave youth of this town from whom I expect great things. I will send you some of his work soon. My son, young Waldo, is very well, and wife Lydian sends her love, R. W. Emerson. Good afternoon. Hello. Ah, oh, you found my home. Good for you, Henry. I wanted to look at that passage about the generations of mankind and how they're like the autumn leaves. You know the one I mean. Yes, I've read it. Well, that's good. I'd hoped you would and that it would give you inspiration. Your experiment reminds me of the image of heroic life that Homer gives us. I wonder, can we all make our lives heroic in our quality of living, if not on the field of battle? Since you're here, I've also been looking all over for my works of Confucius. I was reading it the other day down by the marsh. Have you seen it there by any chance? Yes, I have seen it and can get it for you. Oh, that's wonderful. When you come back, we can discuss the passage I'm looking for. I look forward to it. Goodbye for now. Men have become the tools of their tools. The man who independently plucked the fruits when he was hungry has become a farmer. And he who stood under a tree for a shelter, a housekeeper. We now no longer camp as for a night, but have settled down on earth and forgotten heaven. As I walked in the woods to see the birds and squirrels, so I walked to the village to see the men and boys. Instead of the wind among the pines, I heard the carts rattle. In one direction from my house, there was a colony of muskrats in the river meadows. Under the grove of elms and buttonwoods in the other horizon was a village of busy men, as curious to me as if they had... Oh, here come John and Henry, mother, back from their adventures. How was it? Did the boat sail well? Did you see beyond the horizon? Oh, you both look full of good sun and stories. I can't wait to hear them all. Tell what new flowers you found blooming first. July 1838. Dear Messieurs Thoreau, my sister, whom you know, has sent me a copy of the Yeoman's Gazette with your advertisement for a new Concord Academy and suggested I contact you regarding the education of my son, Edmund Sewell. Edmund is a bright pupil and is in need of instruction preparatory to a collegiate course with the usual English branches of study. I will send him with my daughter Ellen as chaperone to meet you at your earliest convenience. Sincerely, Reverend Edmund Quincy Sewell. Society is commonly too cheap. We meet at the post office and at the sociable and about the fireside every night. 
we live thick and are in each other's way, and stumble over one another, and I think that we thus lose some respect for one another. Good evening, Henry. Good evening. The cost of a thing is the amount of what I will call life, which is required to be exchanged for it, immediately or in the long run. What can I do for you? For my part, I could easily do without the post office. I think that there are very few important communications made through it. For a long time, I was a reporter to a journal of no very wide circulation, whose editor has never yet seen fit to print the bulk of my contributions, and, as is too common for writers, I got only my labor from my pains. Ah, Henry Thoreau, is it then? I hear you finally got your little cabin built out there by the pond. Now, why would a man want to spend all his time alone, I ask you? Give me a good warm house and a hot dinner, is what I say. The village appeared to me a great newsroom, and on one side, to support it, as one set Redding and Companies on State Street, they kept nuts and raisins, or salt and meal and other groceries. I bought the shanty of James Collins, an Irishman who worked on the Fitchburg Railroad, for boards to use in my house.
Here in the woods, I live in each season as it passes, breathe the air, drink the drink, taste the fruit, and resign myself to the influence of the earth. I was as much affected by the faint hum of a mosquito making its invisible and unimaginable tour through my apartment at earliest dawn as I could be by any trumpet that ever sang of fame. When I return to my house, I find that visitors have been there and left their cards. Either a bunch of flowers, or a wreath of evergreen, or a name in pencil on a yellow walnut leaf, or a chip. August, 1845. Dear Henry, don't forget that we care for you and miss you at home. Should you visit, I have left a surprise for you on the game table, as I know you love a good challenge. Stay safe and healthy. Your sister, Sophia. Books are the treasured wealth of the world and the fit inheritance of generations and nations. Books, the oldest and the best, stand naturally and rightfully on the shelves of every cottage. Confucius said, To know that we know what we know, and that we do not know what we do not know, that is true knowledge. As I came home through the woods, I caught a glimpse of a woodchuck stealing across my path, and felt a strange thrill of savage delight, and was strongly tempted to seize and devour him raw. Not that I was hungry then, except for that wildness which he represented.
All sound heard at the greatest possible distance produces one and the same effect, the vibration of the universal lyre. Just as the intervening atmosphere makes a distant ridge of the earth interesting to our eyes by the azure tint it imparts to it. is exceptional. I think it may be the purest strain and the loftiest that has yet peeled from this unpoetic American forest. Tell me, what are you working on next? And have you thought much of publishing your work so that it might reach beyond our small hamlet? Ah, you found my Confucius. Good for you, Henry. I wanted to look at that passage about Knowing what we know and what we don't know. I know you must know the what I mean. Yes, I've read it. Well, that's good. I'd hoped you would and that it would give you inspiration. Your experiment reminds me quite a bit of what Confucius says about needing only coarse rice for food, water to drink, and the bended arm for a pillow to achieve happiness. Since we're discussing these ethical scriptures, I've also been looking all over for my laws of Manu. I was reading it the other day over by the cleared area near Haywood's Peak. Have you seen it there by any chance? Yes, I have seen it and can get it for you. Oh, that's wonderful. When you come back, we can discuss the passage I'm looking for. I look forward to it. Goodbye for now. My dear Miss Fuller, it is good to hear from you that work on the next issue of The Dial Proceeds. I am sending you a new piece that my young friend Thoro has written for our journal. Talk with him but a few hours and you will find him a remarkable person, I am certain. He is a treasured companion, and I have had the most memorable conversations with him about nature and all else. We are all well, and young Waldo sends you his love. R. W. Emerson One afternoon, near the end of the first summer, when I went to the village to get a shoe from the cobblers, I was seized and put into jail, because, as I have elsewhere related, I did not pay a tax to, or recognize the authority of, the state which buys and sells men, women, and children, like cattle, at the door of its senate house. I had gone down to the woods for other purposes, but... Wherever a man goes, men will pursue and paw him with their dirty institutions and, if they can, constrain him to belong to their desperate, odd fellow society. Under a government which imprisons any unjustly, the true place for a just man is also a prison.
I have paid no poll tax for six years. I was put into a jail once on this account for one night, and as I stood considering the walls of solid stone, two or three feet thick, the door of wood and iron a foot thick, and the iron grating which strained the light, I could not help being struck with the foolishness of that institution which treated me as if I were mere flesh and blood and bones to be locked up. I did not for a moment feel confined, and the wall seemed a great waste of stone and mortar. Henry and John have decided to start their own school, Father. It means they won't be able to help much in the pencil factory, but they already have several students promised to attend, and it will be a fine, uncommon school, won't it, Henry? Dear Henry, I have set a little game for you based on our own favorite board, the woods. Here is the first piece of the puzzle. I rise above the forest floor, where once I lay in days of yore. A gentle hand has made formation in places hidden, though not forbidden. Come find me if you seek inspiration. Bon chance, Sophia. Dear Ellen, Sophia tells me you enjoyed the poems I sent, so here are some more brief lines for you with my best wishes. Nature never makes haste. Her systems revolve at an even pace. The bud swells imperceptibly, without hurry or confusion, as though the short spring days were an eternity. Why then should man hasten, as if anything less than an eternity were allotted for the last deed? As the wise man is not anxious that time wait for him, neither does he wait for it. Henry Thoreau Hello, Henry. Hello. What can I do for you? Hello then, Henry. Here for your mail or just snooping for news? I hear there will be a rally soon about these slavery questions. That abolitionist from Boston, Mr. Garrison, will be speaking. But I don't know much about such things. Good evening. Hello.
Our written word is the choicest of relics. It is something at once more intimate with us and more universal than any other work of art. Found my laws of Manu. Good for you, Henry. I wanted to look at that passage about temperance and the ways of Brahma. I know you know the one I mean. Yes, I've read it. Well, that's good. I'd hope you would, and that it would give you inspiration. I wonder if this text, one of the four works of supreme authority for the Hindus, doesn't speak directly to your own experiment. As Manu says, resignation of all pleasures is far better than the attainment of them. It's so vital for us to read the wisdom of all the ancient philosophers. But speaking of which, I'm also looking for my Plato. I was reading it the other day down on the northwest shore of the pond. Have you seen it there by any chance? Yes, I have seen it and can get it for you. That's wonderful. When you come back, we can discuss the passage I'm looking for. I look forward to it. Goodbye for now.
Oh, you found my Plato. Good for you, Henry. I wanted to look at that passage about men's blindness to truth and the allegory of the cave. I know you know the one I mean. Yes, I've read it. That's good. I'd hoped you would, and that it would give you inspiration. Your own experiment is much like that of the man who leaves the cave and goes into the light, don't you think? And the rest of us, living in our safe houses, are the men left in the dark. I hope you won't think less of us for not braving the woods full time. Speaking of the woods, I've been searching them in vain for my Bhagavad Gita. I was reading it out near the Fairyland Meadow and seemed to have lost it. Have you seen it by any chance? Yes, I have seen it and can get it for you. Well, that's wonderful. When you come back, we can discuss the passage I'm looking for. I look forward to it. Goodbye for now. I had more visitors while I lived in the woods than at any other period in my life. I mean that I had some. I had withdrawn so far within the great ocean of solitude, into which the rivers of society empty, that for the most part, so far as my needs were concerned, only the finest sediment was deposited around me. It should not be by their architecture, but why not even by their power of abstract thought, that nations should seek to commemorate themselves? How much more admirable the Bhagavad Gita than all the ruins of the East?
For the most part, I minded not how the hours went. The day advanced as if to light some work of mine. It was morning, and lo, now it is evening, and nothing memorable is accomplished. This was sheer idleness to my fellow townsmen, no doubt. But if the birds and flowers had tried me by their standard, I should not have been found wanting. One day, I came upon the moldering wreck of a boat, the sides gone, and hardly more than the impression of its flat bottom left amid the rushes, yet its model was sharply defined, as if it were a large decayed pad with its veins. It was as impressive a wreck as one could imagine on the seashore, and had as good a I thought, as I have my living to get, and have not eaten today, that I might go a-fishing. That's the true industry for poets. It is the only trade I have learned. Ah, the pickerel of Walden. I'm always surprised by their rare beauty. They possess a quite dazzling and transcendent beauty which separates them by a wide interval from the cadaverous cod and haddock whose fame is trumpeted in our streets. They are not green like the pines, nor gray like the stones, nor blue like the sky, but they have, to my eyes, if possible, yet rarer colors, like flowers and precious stones, as if they were the pearls, the animalized nuclei or crystals of the Walden water. To read well, that is, to read true books in a true spirit, is a noble exercise, and one that will task the reader more than any exercise which the customs of the day esteem. It requires a training such as the athletes underwent, the steady intention almost of the whole life to this object. Books must be read as deliberately and reservedly as they were written. The whistles of the locomotive penetrates my wood summer and winter, sounding like the scream of a hawk sailing over some farmer's yard. Here come your groceries, country, your rations, countrymen, and here's your pay for them, screams the countryman's whistle. All the Indian huckleberry hills are stripped. 
All the cranberry meadows are raked into the city. Up comes the cotton, down goes the woven cloth. Up comes the silk, down goes the woolen. Up comes the books, but down goes the wit that writes them. I watch the passage of the morning cars with the same feeling that I do the rising of the sun, which is hardly more regular. Their train of clouds stretching far behind and rising higher and higher, going to heaven while the cars are going to Boston. Oh, oh he hello. Found my ah, good Peter. morning. Good for you, Henry. I wanted to look at that passage about the banyan tree that has its boughs beneath and its roots above. I know you know the one I mean. Yes, I've read it. That's good. I had hoped you would and that it would give you inspiration. I think you might be like the banyan tree, Henry, with its leaves all green and waving hymns which whisper truth. That is, if you keep your plan and don't waste your days away huckleberrying. Doesn't the Bhagavad Gita say that he who knows the banyan tree knows Veds and all? I've been looking for my Rig Veda, by the way. I was reading it the other day down by the southern shore of the pond. Have you seen it there by any chance? Yes, I have seen it and can get it for you. Oh, that's wonderful. When you come back, we can discuss the passage I'm looking for. I look forward to it. Goodbye for now. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, you found my rig better. Good for you, Henry. I wanted to look at that passage about the beginning of all things, the highest and the lowest places. I know you know the one I mean. Yes, I've read it. Well, it's good. I'd hoped you would, and that it would give you inspiration. And don't you ask as well, what was the wood? What was the tree from which heaven and earth were fashioned forth? 
sometimes, I think that you might find that very tree here in the woods of Walden. All of this research is for a new lecture I'm drafting, based on my early essay, Nature. I was rereading it the other day out by the cliff and must have left it there. Have you seen it by any chance? Yes, I have seen it and can get it for you. Oh, that's wonderful. When you come back, we can discuss the passage I'm looking for. I look forward to it. Goodbye for now. I have sometimes disturbed a fishhawk sitting on a white pine over the water, but I doubt if it is ever profaned by the wind of a gull, like Fairhaven. Oh, you found my copy of Nature. Mm -hmm. Now I can get my work done on the new lecture. I wanted to look at that passage about going into solitude. I know you know much about this by now, so I hope that the passage might resonate with your experiment. You've been such a good friend to help me, Henry. But now you should get on with your own work. Leave off the huckleberry parties and get back to your time in the woods. You can always come back and use my library if you need inspiration. Farewell.
About 15 years ago, you could see the top of a pitch pine, of the kind called yellow pine, projecting above the surface in deep water, many rods from the shore. It was even supposed by some that the pond had sunk, and this was one of the primitive forests that formerly stood there. Many men walk by day, few walk by night. It is a very different season. Chancing to take a memorable walk by moonlight some years ago, I resolved to take more such walks and make acquaintance with another side of nature.
Ah, oh, hello. Hello. Ah, you're back, Henry. I have much work to do or I'd go for a walk with you. Feel free to use my library for inspiration as long as you like. Farewell. Summer is gone now, with all its infinite wealth, and still nature is genial to me. Though I no longer pluck so many berries on the hill, still I behold the same inaccessible beauty around me. I observed that the vitals of the village were the grocery, the bar room, the post office, and the bank. And, as a necessary part of the machinery, they kept a bell a big gun and a fire engine at convenient places, and the houses were so arranged so that every traveler had to run the gauntlet, and every man, woman, and child might get a lick at him. Here is Miss Sewell, come to visit her brother at the school again. I don't know which of our two professors looks more handsome, do you, Ellen? John and Henry are regular peacocks when you are here with us. Come, let's all go for a row on the pond and settle their feathers. <laughs> Dear Ellen, I think of our time together often, and hope that we will meet again soon. Till then, I send another poem for you. Two sturdy oaks, which side by side withstand the winter's storm, and spite of wind and tide, grow up the meadow's pride, for both are strong. Above they barely touch, but undermined, down to their deepest source, admiring, you shall find, their roots are intertwined, inseparably. Henry. Signs were hung out on all sides to allure him, some to catch him by the appetite as the tavern and the victualling cellar, some by the fancy as the dry goods store and the jewelers, and others by the hair or the feet or the skirts as the barber, the shoemaker, or the tailor. What can I do for you?
Most of the luxuries and many of the so-called comforts of life are not only not indispensable, but positive hindrances to the elevation of mankind. Ah, there you are, Henry. Still squatting out there in the woods, then? Hope that you're careful with your fires out there. We wouldn't want to see you burn down more of our fine woods. My dear Thoro, believe me when I say that I have tried to do you the favor of getting your article into the hands of publishers. But I have not had success in this errand, and have hardly a hope that it will be immediate, if ever. I know you have written a good thing, too good, I fear, to be profitable to yourself or attractive to publishers. I will remain your champion in these matters, however, and entreat you to send me that one piece you were working on when we met at your family home. Remember me to Ralph Waldo Emerson. Yours heartily, Horace Greeley. Dear Mr. Thoreau, Dr. Agassiz was quite satisfied with the specimens you sent last month. He says to tell you that the small mud turtle was actually a very rare species quite distinct from the snapping turtle as you labeled it. We would be very much obliged if you could supply us with samples of the following fishes from your small pond and can pay 75 cents apiece. Five common shiners, three yellow perch, one walleye, Sincerely, James Elliot Cabot, assistant to Dr. Agassiz, Harvard University. Have not men improved somewhat in punctuality since the railroad was invented? Do they not talk and think faster in the depot than they did in the stage office? To do things railroad fashion is now the byword. Shall we always study to obtain more of these things, and not sometimes to be content with less? We boast that we belong to the 19th century and are making the most rapid strides of any nation. But consider how little this village does for its own culture. It is time that we had uncommon schools, that we did not leave off our education when we begin to be men and women. While civilization has been improving our houses, it has not equally improved the men who are to inhabit them.
Good day, Henry. Hello. You must work more diligently on your writing, Henry. Don't be distracted with careless idols. Take care to discriminate between what appears and what is. Let others seem. Trust yourself to being. Open your senses and let nature think through you. Only then will you attain true culture. Dear Emerson, I think you might be interested in our friend Thoreau's thoughts on the subject of slavery in Massachusetts. He has much to say that makes good sense. I may encourage him to write these ideas down for publication in Mr. Garrison's Liberator. What do you think? Yours sincerely, A. Bronson Alcott. Ah, oh, hello. Hello. Ah, oh, you're back, Henry. Farewell. Massive men lead lives of quiet desperation. What is called resignation is confirmed desperation. From the desperate city you go into the desperate country, and have to console yourself with the bravery of minks and muskrat.
June, 1839. Dear Sophia, I so enjoyed spending time with Henry and John on their recent visit. We went boating every day and took long walks in the woods. Henry knows so much about each of the plants and flowers, it is quite a marvel. And John is so jolly and fun. I hardly know which brother is a better companion, and I'm glad not to have to choose. Best, Ellen. August 1838. Dear Sophia, it was so kind of your family to welcome us, and I hope we will see you all again soon. Edmund looks forward to starting his studies with your brothers, and I'm sure we will all see much more of each other. The poems Henry sent came safely and pleased us much. The sonnet entitled Beauty is my favorite. Best regards, Ellen Sewell. Good day, Henry. Good afternoon. What can I do for you? Dear Mr. Emerson, thank you for your hospitality of late. I look forward to our next conversations, and with Mr. Thoreau as well. He is a singular character, is he not? A young man with much wild, original nature in him, sophisticated in a way of his own, a keen and delicate observer of nature, and nature, in return for his love, seems to adopt him as her special child and shows him secrets which few others are allowed to witness. 
Yours, Nathaniel Hawthorne. Ah, oh, hello. Hello. Ah, you're back, Henry. Farewell. The woodchoppers have laid the forest to waste, and now for many a year there will be no more rambling through the aisles of the wood with occasional vistas through which you can see the water. My muse may be excused if she is silent henceforth. How can you expect the birds to sing when their groves are cut down?
As the sparrow had its trill, sitting on the hickory before my door, so had I my chuckle or suppressed warble which he might hear out of my nest. Interesting. October, 1845. Dearest Henry, Mother asks how you are doing with your work out there in the woods. Won't you come home sometime? I have been sorting through some old letters that you might like to see, and have left them out for you. Sophia. Dear Henry, it seems like Concord is growing so rapidly these days. I see in the post office that there is much surveying work to be had for someone like yourself, who knows the land and loves to walk its every vista. Of course, surveying does aid in the parceling up of your beloved woods, and yet it is a living that could keep you while you write and live close to nature. A difficult choice, certainly. Yours sincerely, R.W.E. Dear Henry, tomorrow I need your assistance to guide a weary traveler toward the North Star. Like yourself, he is also named Henry. I will leave my instructions here at your cabin tomorrow morning, and they must be followed before the end of night. Most sincerely, A. Bronson Alcott. No man ever stood the lower in my estimation for having a patch in his clothes. Yet I am sure that there is greater anxiety commonly to have fashionable, or at least clean and unpatched clothes, than to have a sound conscience. We know but few men, a great many coats and breeches. Before we can adorn our houses with beautiful objects, the walls must be stripped. 
and our lives must be stripped, and beautiful housekeeping and beautiful living be laid for a foundation. A taste for the beautiful is most cultivated out of doors, where there is no house and no housekeeper. At night there was never a traveler passed by my house, or knocked at my door, more than if I were the first or last man. I believe that men are generally still a little afraid of the dark, though the witches are all hung, and Christianity and candles have been introduced. Time is but the stream I go a-fishing in. I drink at it. But while I drink, I see the sandy bottom and detect how shallow it is. Its thin current slides away, but eternity remains. I would drink deeper, fish in the sky, whose bottom is pebbly with stars. I cannot count one. To anticipate, not the sunrise and the dawn merely, but if possible, nature herself. How many mornings, summer and winter, before yet any neighbor was stirring about his business, have I been about mine? Henry, now is the time for action. RWE has contributed 50 cents towards a train ticket, and Sophia has prepared a bundle of necessities for our weary friend, Henry Williams. Take this bundle to the ruined shelter along the side of the railroad tracks, and hide them in the place I've marked on your map. From there, he will find his way north to Canada. These must be placed before the end of night tonight. Yours sincerely, A. Bronson Alcott.
If the day and the night are such that you greet them with joy, and life emits a fragrance like flowers and sweet-scented herbs, is more elastic, more starry, more immortal, that is your success. All nature is your congratulation, and you have cause momentarily to bless yourself. I never found the companion that was so companionable as solitude. A man thinking or working is always alone. Let him be where he will. Solitude is not measured by the miles of space that intervene between a man and his fellows. My dear Thoreau, I learned today that your essay is accepted to appear in Graham's magazine. It is likely to be paid for at the usual rate of $12, but I have not heard a word on that yet. I think you may need to wait until the article appears before making further inquiries on payment. In the meanwhile, please send me more of the same short subjects as you have them ready, and I will be your agent in further business of this sort. Success to you, my friend, Horace Greeley. Good to see you, Henry. Hello. What can I do for you?
Henry! Henry, are you all right? Henry! Now, in the late fall, nature begins to strip herself like an athlete for her contest with her great antagonist, Winter, and the bare trees and twigs I see such a display of muscle.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Ah, you're back, Henry. I have much work to do, or I'd go for a walk with you. Feel free to... Farewell.
Good, Henry. Mr. Garrison has heard of your sentiments against slavery in our nation. I know that his recent lecture at our Lyceum roused you quite thoroughly. He asks if you won't write something for the Liberator on the topic. I suggest sending this manuscript on slavery in Massachusetts that you left with me recently. It will certainly move many hearts and minds. With thanks, Alcott. Many thanks, dear Henry. With your help, our friend, Henry Williams, found the supplies left for him and made his way on to town, where he was also assisted by your sister, Sophia, and your mother. They ministered to him with cheerfulness and devotion, and he is on his way north as I write. It is clear to me that, as Mr. Garrison says, the destiny of the slaves is in the hands of American women. Your friend, A. Bronson Alcott. November, 1845. Henry, the seasons are turning now, and we all feel the coldness of time. Does the work progress? Do you think it will be done by spring? Have you prepared well for the winter to set in? Love, Sophia. I hardly know what you do with your time, Henry. The children say you took them out huckleberrying all day rather than working on those edits I suggested for your article. Sometimes I think I would like to see your work published more than you would.
Henry, there you are. Good afternoon. Ah, you're back, Henry. I have much... Farewell. Dear Emerson, I thank you for your kind words on the dial and for sending the piece by Mr. Thoreau. I do not see the full merits of the work as you have described, yet having some knowledge of the man, there is no objection I could make to his lines which I would not make to himself. He is rare, of open eye, ready hand, and noble scope. He sets no limits to his life, but is somewhat a bare hill which the warm gales of spring have not yet visited. A wider and deeper human experience will mold the man and melt his verse. I can have no better advice for a person so sincere. Margaret Fuller Dear Counselor, I write in assistance of a young friend of mine, Mr. Henry David Thoreau, who has taken time from his literary pursuits to invent a new, improved method for the production of pencils. I believe a patent application for this method would be successful, and the financial support from such a patent would be of great importance to this young man's family. Might you look at the drawings and specifications included and give us advice on how to make such an application? Sincerely, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Don't let Ellen's rejection of your offer come between you, Henry. It's a terrible blow. I know you and John both cared for her deeply, but think if she had accepted one and left the other to watch their happiness from the outside. No, to turn you both down was the kindest thing she could do. And you still have John and I and our beloved Woods to console you. November 1840. Dear Sophia, I have never felt so badly in my life as the day I refused Henry's letter of proposal. But Father does not approve of his transcendental philosophies and instructed me to refuse in a short, explicit, and cold manner. It is all over now, and I hope that though I have dashed the hopes of both your brothers, we can still remain friends in the end. Ellen. Your sister was just in and collected a letter from your old friend, Miss Sewell. We haven't seen her much recently. My friend Thoreau, I know that there has been much delay, but your article is this moment in type and will appear as the leading article in Graham's magazine for next month. I will see that Graham pays you fairly for it. Do not think hard of him. I am enclosing two dollars until such time as he does. I propose that if you will sit down and write another article for me, I will give you twelve dollars for it on delivery, publish it, and leave you the copyright. Do not write too long, or more quickly than you can think, for that will not work for the magazines. Yours, Horace Greeley. Hello, Henry. Hello. What can I do for you?
Interesting.
Dearest Henry, you are a model of self-reliance. I am overwhelmed with admiration, as is my daughter Louisa, who speaks of you often with youthful affection. I write to tell you that your article is in print in Mr. Garrison's Liberator. He tells me it makes him weep with fury. Surely this is payment enough for your troubles. Your friend, A. Bronson Alka.
Winter has arrived and a regular snowstorm has commenced, fine flakes falling steadily and rapidly whitening all the landscape. In half an hour the russet earth is painted white even to the horizon. I know of no other so silent and sudden a change. Henry! Henry! Are you all right? Henry!
Oh, there you are, Henry. I almost miss seeing you so familiar as your shape there by our hearth. Lydian and I were just saying that we think of you almost as one of our own family now. So often do we see you here. Be sure you keep some time for your own work now, along with all the chores my wife puts you to. I hear the writing is finally going along well. Dear Lydian, all is well while you are away, though our dial, I fear, may be languishing. Henry helps with the household chores and the children. He's like one of our family now. I often find him whittling whistles for Waldo or popping corn in the fireplace in the evenings. I think perhaps you should come home soon, or he will forget his writing altogether in the comforts of our home. Be safe and well, R.W. Dear Emerson, I am sorry to write and mar your fine holidays with editorial vexation. However, our next issue of The Dial is not progressing as we would hope. Can you please urge your writers to send the manuscripts they have promised, and to take the advisement that we have given on their contents? I fear that without attention, our Dial will not be long in print. Most sincerely, your friend, Margaret Fuller. An article? Published? Here, let me read it. What magic you work, Henry. Though I'm sure Mr. Emerson had some hand in this, did he not? The fees will be of such help to Father since the factory isn't doing well. And what will John say? His own little brother, a published author no less. Good tidings of the season, son. Some lamp oil to keep your little cabin bright and warm, father. Merry Christmas, Henry. Here are some lovely oranges to sweeten your time in the woods. Love, Sophia. Joyeux Noel. I thought you might need some warm clothes for the long winter ahead. Love, Mother. Hello, Henry. Good evening. What can I do for you? A fine Christmas to you, Henry. Come into town to ward off the chill of the woods, have you? I wager your mother has some hot pie for you to nip. Public opinion is a weak tyrant compared with our own private opinion. What a man thinks of himself, that is which determines, or rather indicates, his fate.
Henry. Henry, are you all right? December, 1845. Dearest Henry, how do you fare in these deep months of winter? We worry for your health, never strong. Mother has taken ill, and I worry for you as well. Be sure to make your way home to us for the holidays, as we have some festive offerings just for you. Fa la 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 la, <laughs> Sophia.
Henry, are you all right?
Henry, there you are. Hello. Joyo Noel, I thought you might need some warm clothes for the long winter ahead. Love, Mother. Merry Christmas, Henry. Here are some lovely oranges to sweeten your time in the woods. Love, Sophia.
Good to see you, Henry. Good evening. It is never too late to give up our prejudices. No way of thinking or doing, however ancient, can be trusted without proof. Nature and human life are as various as our several constitutions. Who shall say what prospect life offers to another? Could a greater miracle take place than for us to look through each other's eyes for an instant? Good tidings of the season, son. Some lamp oil to keep your little cabin bright and warm, father. Every man is the builder of a temple, called his body, to the god he worships, after a style purely his own. Nor can he get off by hammering marble instead. We are all sculptors and painters, and our material is our own flesh and blood and bones. Any nobleness begins at once to refine a man's features, any meanness to embrute them. The greater part of what my neighbors call good I believe in my soul to be bad, and if I repent of anything it is very likely to be my good behavior. What demon possessed me that I behaved so well? Hello, Henry. Hello. What can I do for you? Is not January the hardest month to get through? When I have weathered that, I will get into the Gulf Stream of winter, nearer the shores of spring. Dear Henry, I see that your family was among the first to sign the recent petition for disunion with the slave-holding southern states. It is a sign of changing sentiments in our small country. Even so, we have much work to do, and I require your assistance once again tomorrow morning. Be certain to check here for my instructions. Hopefully. A. Bronson Alcott. February 1846. Dear Henry, we have not seen you much since the holidays. I feel that you might wish to forget us, and our mutual loss as well. Even though you don't say his name aloud, I know you think of our poor brother John often, as do I. Your loving sister, Sophia.
My friend Thoreau, I have been hurried and have not settled your payment with Graham. I did see him, but it was at a crowded dinner party where I had no chance to question him on business. I enclose you twelve dollars for your article on Maine scenery, as promised. I know it is worth more, though I have not found time to read it. Uh, it is rather long for my columns and too fine for the millions, but I consider it a cheap bargain and shall print it myself if I do not find another magazine. What about your book? Is it going well? Yours, Horace Greeley. Oh, hello, Henry. Did you hear the news about the fugitive slaves that were caught stealing food just last night out by your pond? Quite the excitement. To think, they made it so far only to be caught for lack of supplies. Do not trouble yourself much to get new things, whether clothes or friends. Turn the old, return to them. Things do not change, we change. Sell your clothes and keep your thoughts. I'm afraid there is nothing I can do for the young man. It's the lockjaw, and the poison has gone directly to his blood. Oh, what will we do without our John? He is the light of our household. You must make him comfortable as you can. See there, your brother Henry holds him closely now. But still he slips away. May God be with him. We are lost. We are lost. Our best flower is fading. February, 1842. Dearest Sophia, I have just heard of poor John's passing, and am suffering from the loss of such a friend. I send my heartfelt best to your family. Especially Henry. How will he go on without his brother and best friend? The leaves are falling, falling, solemnly and slow. Caw, caw! The rooks are calling. It is a sound of woe. Ellen. Hello, Henry. Hello. What can I do for you?
Good afternoon, Henry. Good afternoon. What can I do for you?
Listen, Henry. William and Ellen Craft have made their way from Georgia in disguise. She is his light-skinned master, and he is her slave. They are so very close to freedom. Bring these items for them to the abandoned shanty near Fairyland Meadow, and hide them in the place I've marked on your map. Place them before end of night tonight, or they may be captured and returned to a life of enslavement. Yours, A. Bronson Alcott. What can I do for you? Dear friend Thoreau, I trust you have not thought me neglectful with regard to your business. It is only today that I have been able to lay my hand on the money due you from Graham. I have made Graham pay you twelve dollars, but only send you ten to account for my expenses, and shall now stand even with you in money. Thoreau, if you will only write one or two articles in this spirit, but half the length, I can sell them readily. I remain yours, etc. Horace Greeley. It is a terrible blow. First, your brother John is cut down so suddenly. And now my own dear little boy. Unbearable, truly. I may find solace in a long trip far away from the woods and trails that remind me of him so. You are a true friend to watch over my home while I travel. You are more like a brother than my own is to me. Dear friend, my heart goes out to you and Lydian on hearing the news of young Waldo's sudden passing. Such a blow, such a blow. I hate to bring more sadness, but I must resign from our dial. If it is to continue, you must pick up the reins yourself and drive it forward. If only I had been paid some support from my... Ah. My dearest love, Lydian. Our boy, our boy, our little boy is gone. 
Young Waldo was taken ill on Monday evening and died last night. All his wonderful beauty could not save him. He gave up his innocent breath last night, and my world this morning is cold. Shall we ever dare to love anything again? Farewell and farewell, oh my boy. Come home to us as soon as you are able. Good to see you, Henry. What Good can afternoon. I do for you? When I had been exposed to the rudest blasts a long time, my whole body began to grow torpid. When I reached the genial atmosphere of my house, I soon recovered my faculties and prolonged my life. Absent Henry, I regret that you were not able to help William and Ellen Craft as I requested. Without the aid they so desperately needed, they were forced to change course and look for assistance elsewhere. They remain in great peril, as law officials now track and harass fugitives to return to their southern owners under our hateful laws. I hope you will be able to help the next time I call on you. Sincerely, A. Bronson Alcott.
What can I do for you? I do not speak to those who are well employed, in whatever circumstances, and they know whether they are well employed or not, but mainly to the mass of men who are discontented and idly complaining of the hardness of their lot or of the times, when they might improve them. Early in the morning, while all things are crisp with frost, men come with fishing reels and slender lunch and let down their fine lines through the snowy field to take pickerel and perch. Wild men, who instinctively follow other fashions and trust other authorities than their townsmen. As I was desirous to recover the long-lost bottom of Walden Pond, I surveyed it carefully, before the ice broke up with compass and chain and sounding line. There have been many stories told about the bottom, or rather no bottom, of this pond, which certainly had no foundation will believe in the bottomlessness of a pond without taking the trouble to sound it. I sometimes left a good fire when I went to take a walk in a winter afternoon, and when I returned three or four hours afterward, it would be still alive and glowing. I once had a sparrow alight upon my shoulder for a moment, and I felt that I was more distinguished by that circumstance than I should have been by any epaulette I could have worn.
Suddenly, a fox appeared, threading the solemn aisles with an easy coursing pace, whose sound was concealed by a sympathetic rustle of the leaves, swift and still, keeping the round, leaving his pursuers far behind. In our most trivial walks, we are constantly, though unconsciously, steering like pilots by certain well-known beacons and headlands, and if we go beyond our usual course, we still carry in our minds the bearing of some neighboring cape. And not till we are completely lost or turned round, for a man needs only to be turned round once with his eyes shut in this world to be lost, do we appreciate the vastness and strangeness of nature. Why should I feel lonely? Is not our planet in the Milky Way? What sort of space is that which separates a man from his fellows and makes him solitary? The change from storm and winter to serene and mild weather, from dark and sluggish hours to bright and elastic ones, is a memorable crisis which all things proclaim. It is seemingly instantaneous at last. Dear Henry, I hear that you have offered your cabin as location for the Concord Female Anti-Slavery Society to hold its anniversary gathering. I commend you for this, and for ringing the bell of freedom from your post in the woods. However, a more desperate friend also needs your help. Look for my instructions here tomorrow morning, and be ready. Yours, A. Bronson Alcott. I was startled by the honking of geese flying low over the woods, like weary travelers getting in late from southern lakes, and indulging at last in unrestrained complaint and mutual consolation. Standing at my door, I could hear the rush of their wings when, driving toward my house, they suddenly spied my light, and with hushed clamor wheeled and settled in the pond. March 1846. Henry, the ice in the pond is breaking up, and spring is in the air. I know your favorite season in the woods is approaching, but we hope to see you at home soon. Do your work and come home to us strong and healthy. Remember that you are our only brother now, and mother's only son, Sophia. My dear Henry, you have nearly weathered the winter in our woods and seem to be well situated to bear witness to the thaw of your habitat into mud and clay. Are you still finding inspiration out there on the damp edge of our society? Recall, if you will, that a frog was made to live in a swamp, but a man was not made to live in a swamp. Yours ever, R.W.E.
I see you have no head for work now, Henry, but I fear for your genius if you don't go back to writing. What do you find on these long walks of yours? Is there a hidden spring of solace hidden in our woods? Dear Mr. Emerson, it was good to dine with you and Mr. Thoreau last week. He has written a good piece in the last style, which gives the spirit of what he sees. Even as a lake reflects its wooded banks, showing every leaf, yet giving the wild beauty of the whole scene. I sense, however, that such an uncompromising person is fitter to meet occasionally in the open air than to have as a permanent guest at table and fireside. I feel from your cooling praise that you may have suffered some inconvenience in your relations with him. Sincerely, Nathaniel Hawthorne. March, 1842. Dear Ellen, thank you for your kind words and sentiments. Our loss has been almost more than we can bear. Poor Henry does not speak John's name, and last month was strangely struck with all the same symptoms of lockjaw we saw in John, fever and sweats and cramping of the jaw. We were so afraid that we might lose him as well. Sincerely, Sophia. Thank you for coming, Ellen. I'm so worried about our Henry. Without John, he is a shadow without its source. He was so ill at first, and now he roams the woods for hours on end. No one knows where he goes, what he does, but he returns sad and silent. Gone is our merry Huckleberry Captain. I think he intends to go back to work with Father in the pencil factory, now that the school is closed. But I believe that kind of captivity might kill our wild bird spirit forever. I see young men, my townsmen, whose misfortune it is to have inherited farms, houses, barns, cattle, and farming tools, for these are more easily acquired than got rid of. Better if they had been born in the open pasture and suckled by a wolf, that they might have seen with clearer eyes what field they were called to labor in. Good to see you, Henry. Good there afternoon. is an incessant influx of novelty into the world, and yet we tolerate incredible dullness. Just you, Henry. Such doldrums we are in. I can barely move my fingers in this cold. Will we ever see the spring again?
Let us first be as simple and well as nature ourselves. Dispel the clouds which hang over our own brows and take up a little life into our pores. Do not stay to be an overseer of the poor, but endeavor to become one of the worthies of the world. Near the end of winter, when the snow was melted on my south hillside and about my woodpile, the partridges came out of the woods morning and evening to feed there. Every man looks at his woodpile with a kind of affection. I love to have mine before my window, and the more chips, the better to remind me of my pleasing work. I am convinced that if all men were to live as simply as I then did, thieving and robbery would be unknown. These take place only in communities where some have got more than is sufficient while others have not enough. Friend Henry, young Thomas Sims is in grave danger and desperately needs our help. Recently arrived in Boston, concealed aboard a ship from Georgia, he is fleeing north to the border. Sims will go to the ruined shelter in the south woods under cover of darkness tonight, 
and God willing, find the aid he requires. He needs these items to continue, so hide them in the place I've marked on your map before the end of night. Most sincerely, A. Bronson Alcott. On the 1st of April, it rained and melted the ice. And in the early part of the day, which was very foggy, I heard a stray goose groping about over the pond and cackling as if lost, or like the spirit of the fog. I desire that there may be as many different persons in the world as possible, but I would have each one be very careful to find out and pursue his own way, and not his father's or his mother's or his neighbor's instead.
If we knew all the laws of nature, we should need only one fact or the description of one actual phenomenon to infer all the particular results at that point. Now we know only a few laws, and our result is vitiated not, of course, by any confusion or irregularity in nature, but by our ignorance of essential elements in the calculation. When we have obtained those things which are necessary to life, there is another alternative than to obtain the superfluities, and that is to adventure on life now. Success, Henry. I am happy to report the fortuitous outcome of Thomas Sims' journey. With our help, he was able to avoid agents of the law who would have certainly thrust him aboard a ship bound back to slavery in Georgia. It is a terrible state our country is in, slave power that it is. You must do what you can, write and speak your conscience. Your friend, A. Bronson Alka. Interesting.
Good afternoon, Henry. Good afternoon. Dear Thoreau, do not scold me for publishing a part of your last private letter to me in the morning paper. It will do readers a great good to learn of your experiment. What do you think of following out your line of thought in a lecture on your experiment? Should you wish to speak in Boston on such a topic, you would need to appear in a fashionable suit. I do not know what you wear about in the woods these days. I can promise a fee of no less than $20 for the appearance. Yours sincerely, Horace Greeley. What can I do for you? Good day, Henry. Hello. Henry! Henry! Are you all right? Henry! One attraction in coming to the woods was that I should have opportunity to truly see the spring come in. The sky appears broader now than it did. The day has opened its eyelids wider. The lengthening of the days is a kind of forerunner of the next season. Dear Henry, I will soon be off to London and Paris to deliver my new lecture and meet with Mr. Dickens, Lord Tennyson, and Mr. Carlyle. There is quite the revolutionary climate in Paris these days, and Lydia wishes I would not go. But how can I sit idle when America faces our own impending struggles against tyranny? I think if you were to stay here full time with her and the children, her mind would be more at ease in my absence. What do you say? Will you leave your little cabin soon to become a sojourner in civilized life again? R.W.E. May 1846. Dear Henry, 
I hope that your work has gone well, that your experiment has been fruitful. The thaw has finally come, and with it, my hope that you will return home, brother, as our John can never do. You're always loving, Sophia. Mrs. Ripley and her friends were so charmed the other night to hear your account of your housekeeping at Walden Pond. They loved the witty wisdom that ran through it. I dare say you have the makings of a popular piece there. If that is how you wish to write, of course. E. A. Dwinking, Publisher. Dear Sir, Mr. Henry D. Thoreau of this town is working on a book which he wishes to publish. It is the account of his experiment in living in the woods of our Walden Pond. The book has many merits and may be his best work to date. It will be attractive to lovers of nature as well as scholars and to all thoughtful persons for its originality and profoundness. Would you like to print this book in your American library? I am sending you a draft on behalf of the author. Yours respectfully, R. W. Emerson. Ah, hello. Hello. Ah, you're back, Henry. I have much work. Farewell. What an idea, Henry. A cabin in the woods? A and you would live there alone, working and writing? About our woods and your experiment in living? A new kind of adventure. On life, I suppose. I see a thought in you, Henry. Finally. A new dawn. It's a good plan. Rather than love, than money, than fame, give me truth. I sat at a table where were rich food and wine in abundance and obsequious attendance, but sincerity and truth were not, and I went away hungry from the inhospitable board. Dear Mr. Greeley, my brother, Henry Thoreau, has asked me to send you this manuscript of his first book. He says that you have been much interested in his shorter works, and may take this as well. The book follows a boat trip taken with our late brother John on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, and is a meditation on the cyclical nature of time, true friendship, and the understanding of death. I am certain you will find it worthy. Yours, Sophia Thaw. Happy spring to you, Henry. Surely you must be ready to come home now, having seen a full year at the pond. Though it must be fine this time of year, I never have time to see it myself, but a man must make a living.
Henry, are you all right? Henry, are you all right? I left the woods for as good a reason as I went there. Perhaps it seemed to me that I had several more lives to live and could not spare any more time for that one. I learned this, at least, by my experiment. In proportion as one simplifies their life, the laws of the universe will appear less complex, and solitude will not be solitude, nor poverty poverty, nor weakness weakness.
and so the seasons went rolling on into summer. Thus was my first year's life in the woods completed, and the second year was similar to it. Henry, you all right? Good to see you, Henry. Good afternoon. What can I do for you? 